Good afternoon, everyone. I've been looking forward to this session uh, ever since I uh, started talking to Charlie about it. And I'm sure you are as well, so I'm not going to talk very much. I just want to warn you that you will be recorded through this session. And All right, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Vocabulary Lists uh, with Charlie Brown. We will be taking questions in the chat. Uh, please type them in there. Or uh, please uh, use the raise hand button in the participants list. And that way I can tell who wants to chime in. I will be relaying the questions to uh, Dr. Brown as we go. Otherwise, uh, it's time for us to listen to some wise words. Charlie, take it away. <laughs> well, welcome to this uh, session. Um, I, do, I do present a lot about these word lists, uh, but I know that the OTJ group um, is um, different and a lot larger than some of the other uh, groups that I belong to. And I thought that there might be some people uh, among OTJ who wanted to do something more with vocabulary than they've been doing now. So um, I offered to do a session uh, to introduce uh, my word lists, uh, to introduce the importance of vocabulary and introduce um, all, you know, some of the uh, online tools that we use to, to, to utilize uh, these, these lists. Um, let me um, uh, share, a, do a screen share to, and then maybe set up, a, start up a PowerPoint. Um, let me see, hold on a second. Uh, not my desktop, where is the PowerPoint? This is, this is another problem with Zoom is having too many screens open at the, too many uh, things open at the same time. Uh, I'm not seeing it. Uh, desktop. And that's it. Hold on. I, I guess I can do advanced and do. Let me let me do advanced and do portion of the screen. That'll 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 uh, work eventually. Hold on just a second. Uh, you guys are gonna get the okay share. And now what you get is uh, you're getting some of my 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 favorite one of my favorite cars and some of the other things that I want to use. <laughs> oh, this, this is not, this is really weird. I can't uh, manipulate the way I normally can. Let me stop share. This, this is, this is kind of odd. It's not, usually it'll pop right up um, and, and the corners are pullable, but it's not, it's not letting me pull the way I normally am used to using uh, screen share. Let me, let me go back to basic and see if I can get my, uh, Even the bottom left corner, Charlie, bottom right corner. Yeah, it's just, it's, there should be a, you know, usually I would, there's my PowerPoint. Okay, it came up the second time. All right, there we go. All right, so are you seeing the, the, the PowerPoint now? Very good. Okay, so um, what, what you can see on this, on the first slide is, is uh, well, the name of the session, uh, my position, but then, you know, uh, a number of links to um, uh, various uh, websites that I have um, related to word lists and tools. Um, I'll, I'll, it's kind of, if you go to the, the, the first one is called uh, newgeneralservicelist.org. Uh, you know, maybe Jose, you can type that first one into the, into the chat for me. Um, almost all of the other websites are, are accessible, uh, accessible from, from there. Um, okay, let's see, now I'm... Hey Charlie, can you yeah. make your um, your thing a little bit bigger? You're only at uh, just over a hundred percent, and it's uh, not it's okay. not filling the screen. Oh, I, I see, I see. Hold on a second. I'm still uh, rec um, converting the other one. I see what you're, I see what the problem is. Okay, that's that's kind of edge to edge. This particular this particular slide on ERT. Um, hold on a second. Okay, now that's all right. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I mean, I this this slide, I I, I just you know, just put in there to show how different things are now than, than they have been in the past. Um, you know, we, you know, we're, we're fully online and people are looking for online solutions. And I think that, um, you know, right now we're, we're in a situation, you know, often we, you know, people were worried, oh, well, will technology replace us? Will technology replace us? And the answer is obviously not. Um, but p teachers who are good at using technology, um, are the ones that are going to do best. And I think that's, that's part of uh, what OTJ is all about and part of what many of the other groups in, in, in um, JALT is, are, are about, like JALT Call as well, is, is to try and, and help us to think through how we can um, utilize uh, tools you know, online for, for more effective teaching online. But that, the starting point for, for online, I, for me, always has to be pedagogy. So I'm, I'm much less uh, interested in, in hardware and uh, things like that than I am about you know the the pedagogic goal 
And, and often even, even these word lists, uh, the starting point for these word lists was a pedagogic aim, objective aim that I wanted to accomplish. And the online tools, you know, became, you know, just one way of achieving, achieving that aim. So will, you know, for me, the, the two things that I've been most worried about over my, you know, 30 plus years in Japan is, uh, first of all, you know, starting on the JET program and, and working uh, with the Ministry of Education on some of their textbook committees, I, I could see very clearly that, that, that the vocabulary that, that students were learning in junior high and senior high was, was incredibly uh, difficult and probably wrong for them. I didn't, you know. I'm eating already because I have an online session. Whoops. Is, did I do something? Oh. Are we okay? All right. I, I think it's just background noise. Um, so, so I noticed that, that the, the vocabulary that students were studying was generally too difficult and I assumed was, was incorrect. I did research later on that, that, that sort of uh, gave evidence for that point, but also that they didn't have enough vocabulary. And that's something that the more I studied, the more I realized that, that, that um, you know, the numbers game is very uh, important when we're talking about vocabulary. But the other big problem is that the reading materials that, that, that students are exposed to here in Japan are usually way, way above their level. And that causes all kinds of, of problems in the classroom as, as well. Um, so uh, when we look at the, the total number of words in the English language, if you look at the largest dictionaries, the Oxford English Dictionary, the OED, and they talk, they throw out the number on their website, 600,000. And here, 600,000 is referring to uh, word families. So if, if, if we talk about um, the word accept, and we say the word accept, accepting, acceptable, unacceptable, um, all of those would be considered one word in a dictionary, a word family. So if, if we're talking about, you know, word families or lemmas, like the like groupings of, uh, of words, we're talking about 600,000 uh, in, in the English language. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a huge number and it's hard to figure out how to, to, you know, to think about that number until you compare it to the number of these words that the average native speaker knows. And an average adult native speaker who's grown up in an English speaking country and graduated from college only knows about 5% of the, of the English language. Uh, a lot, there's several studies that have, have pegged uh, native speaker, college educated uh, vocabulary size is somewhere between 25 and 30,000. So I just, I just took 30 because that's a nice even 5% of 600,000. So right off the bat, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're cutting away uh, unnecessary words. You know, you, you know, if the student's target is to speak like a native speaker, they can ignore 95% uh, of the English language and just focus on these 30,000. It sounds really good, but in practice, it's, it's not really good. Um, in Japan, after studying English for 10 or 12 years, the number of these 30,000 words that they know is, is actually um, only about somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000. So less than 10%. Um, it's not only a problem in Japan. Uh, there's, there's studies in other countries as well that, that, that show that non-native speakers of English, even after hundreds, if not thousands of hours of study, um, know far fewer words than, than, the, than uh, the average native speaker does. Um, a corollary problem to this is that uh, English reading materials in Japan are, are too hard. Now, we said that um, in Japan, they know somewhere between 2,000, 2,500, maybe 3,000 words at high-level schools. But um, if you know 2,000, if you know the most important 2,000 words, the most frequent 2,000 words, what can you do with it? Well, if you try to read Time magazine, you'll get about 80, 81% coverage. And Time is considered to be, you know, fairly difficult uh, in terms of the uh, reading level compared to uh, something like a newspaper. If you try to read a newspaper, uh, you get a little bit higher coverage, maybe, maybe 85%. So we're talking, uh, you know, a range of 80 to 85% for native speaker materials uh, with the top 2,000 words. But if you try to use, Jap if you try to use those same 2,000 words and read a Japanese high school textbook, you might be surprised to find that the coverage is actually much less. Um, uh, New Crown is one of the most popular books, 75% uh, coverage, but Actually, with some of the other textbooks, it's even lower than 75%. So, so the, the reading materials that, that second language learners are reading is actually harder in some ways than, than materials that, that, that native speakers uh, use. 
So um, what research shows is that um, 80, 85, 75%, those numbers are far too little uh, to be able to read effectively. And so the, the, the absolute minimum, sorry, this is the recording from the, the previous session. Uh, let me just get that out of the way. Um, Okay, the, the, the absolute minimum for being able to read and guess from context uh, is 90%, but uh, the number that most people are throwing around these days is somewhere between 95 and, and, and 98%. And obviously, uh, we're, we're not there yet. Uh, certainly, you know, Japanese students are only somewhere in the 60 to 70% range on average. So, so there's a huge gap there. And this is this sort of brings me to to my own research, um, and that is uh, basically to try and identify shortcuts for second language learners. So the NGSL, the New General Service List, we're calling it a project now because we have so many word lists and tools. The NGSL project is basically about trying to create shortcuts for second language learners. We're trying to make very tight lists of tight short lists of vocabulary words that are going to help students to be able to read and guess from context or listen and guess from context without the help of dictionaries or, or a teacher. So as I said, 90% was the uh, minimum and um, the new general service list actually hits that. So what I'm going to take you through, um, you know, probably over the next 30 minutes or so is a real quick you know, sort of whirlwind uh, tour of, of the seven different word lists that we have, uh, some of the assessment tools we've created, some learning tools that we either we've created or we're using, and uh, some analytical tools, one that we created and, and several that we're just using. Um, everything that you'll see here is, is open source and free, uh, so hopefully it will be of use to you. Um, Charlie? Yes. Uh, I don't know when you want to have the questions, but I have a question in chat. Yeah, yes, please. And actually, let's we can we can stop anytime. I'm I'm you know I actually would rather, um, you know, uh, have questions and 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 discussion. Okay, uh, from Andrew Johnson uh, about maybe three minutes ago. How do you define knowing a word? That's a that's a very that's a very good question, and uh, I I don't have those slides in this PowerPoint, but to to, to put it simply. Um, uh, Paul Nation has identified more than 20 aspects of knowing a word, uh, ranging from receptive to productive knowledge, you know, being able to recognize a word, being able to spell a word, being able to pronounce a word, being able to use it in a sentence. There's a huge range. Um, for, um, for my purposes and, and for the purpose of the NGSL uh, project, we're mostly focusing on, on, on uh, knowing a word being uh, minimally to recognize the word and associate a definition with it. Um, and we know that that's receptive knowledge, but we believe that, that receptive knowledge is a very, very important starting point. And, and that until students have receptive knowledge of every single one of the new general service list words, um, it's very difficult for students to be able to read and guess from context. It doesn't mean that knowing, having receptive knowledge of the NGSL um, is enough to make you a fluent uh, speaker of English, but it's a very, very useful, uh, uh, important uh, threshold uh, to cross, a very useful starting point. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later and we can, you know, but knowing a word, uh, you yeah, know, there's, there's a huge range of what, of what that means. So for the, as I said, 90% um, is the minimum to be able to read and guess from context. You can see in this slide, uh, 600,000 words in the English language, native speakers know about 30,000. Uh, with just a very tiny subset, less than 10% of what a native speaker knows, if you know the 2,800 words of the new general service list, you're going to get somewhere between uh, 90 and 92% coverage, sometimes even higher, uh, for most uh, magazines, newspapers, books, and even higher percentage coverage if you're talking about listening materials. Um, so we'll, you know, I'll, I'll describe that in a little bit more, more detail uh, later. Um, almost all, all of our word lists, not almost, all of our word lists are corpus based. And that's what we mean. What I mean by corpus is we create a large um, selection of text that we believe will be representative of the kind of language that the learner will need. And then we analyze that corpus and we, we try to figure out what are the most important words. Uh, for some of our lists, that's just the starting point. It's modified uh, after that by uh, input from expert teachers and expert lexicographers. But um, 
um, you know, the, a very big chunk of what we do is, is corpus based. And what you can see for the NGSL, we're taking a 273 million word corpus that, that ranges from fiction and nonfiction learner, you know, there's a learner sub corpus, there's spoken uh, in the form of radio English, TV English, and unscripted uh, spoken. Um, wide range, of, you know, wide range of, uh, of, of English language materials. Now, um, how can we get such high coverage? How can we get such high coverage with so few words? This has to do with a mathematical uh, principle known as Zipf's Law. And I think even if I read it out loud, it doesn't really make that much sense to most people. But uh, it basically states that frequency decreases with rank. More precisely, frequency is inversely proportional to rank. Everybody got that? Probably, probably not. I mean, it's, it's hard to conceptualize, but if you look at it visually, uh, Ziff's law is very easy to understand. And so what I've done in the next slide is I've taken a 10 million word sample from the Cambridge corpus, and we're gonna look at, 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 at how high frequency words give much, you know, very high coverage of the corpus, and the low frequency words offer almost no coverage. So what you can see here, the blue words, uh, this is for a 10 million word sample of the Cambridge corpus. The blue words uh, represent the 2000 most important, most frequent ones, 83% um, coverage by the first 2000 words. That means 8.3 million words out of the 10 million words in this sample are the same words over and over again, those same 2000 words over and over again. If you were to study the next most frequent 2000 words in this sample, you would only get another 5%. Uh, so 83%, 88% coverage for uh, 4,000 words, and then 3% for the next. So if you get to 6,000 words, you're up to 91%, just hitting that minimum, and so on. So the Ziffian, uh, Ziff's law, uh, it, it, it's the Ziffian curve. And the Ziffian curve, if you were to draw a line from the top of the blue box to the top of the green box in yellow and purple and so on, you can see the drop off is huge after that first 2000, right? That's the Ziffian curve. So what, you know, what we're seeing here is, is, is the um, disproportionate importance of the highest frequency words. And, and that's why I said that, that, that at least receptive knowledge of every single one of the NGSL words is essential. Because if you don't know those blue words, and say, you, say for example, your students were studying the, only the green words and the purple words and the yellow words, no matter how many thousands of words they study, they're never going to be able to hit that 90% threshold. It's mathematically impossible. So that's why, Harley? yes. Sorry, uh, just wanted to get this in there because it's uh, kind of time dependent. Um, uh, David Juteau, 1215 PM. Uh, he writes, kids, on the last slide, so he was thinking about the last slide before he just wrote this. Kids, on the last slide, what is the starting point for kids? David, oh. if you want to open your mic, maybe, if, if I didn't read that properly for you. That's, it's one slide, bef two slides before now. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, so this, this slide? Yeah, yeah, somewhere, maybe one more before that. Somewhere where you, I saw kids. Um, oh, okay, They're okay. Kids, kids NDL. Yeah, so, so, oh, you'd like to see that before, before, like, like, you want me to jump ahead to the kids, uh, Corpus? No, 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 no. If you're no. going there, I'll, I'll, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. I, this is, um, and I, I can, you know, absolutely, I'm happy to jump around. No. Um, and this can even show you, just to show you the next slide, um, I, which will, will show you. I have two new word lists that we're releasing this month. They're already finished. We just haven't put them up on the website. One of them is, you, you can see, and let's start with the yellow. So, so, you know, if you look on the very far left, of this slide, mm. 600,000 words. You can see the yellow 2800. Those are core daily vocabulary. In my opinion, those are the words that every single EFL learner must master first. That's the, These are words that occur everywhere. And if you don't know them, you mathematically impossible to get to those high coverage figures that you want. But step two, after you've learned the high frequency words, I think the next slide sort of just moves the, oops, so, so this, let me see. Um, I just want to, I think I, I'm, I don't know my slides well enough here. Yeah, there you go. So step two um, is to learn special purpose words. Um, after you've mastered the yellow words, then you, you, you combine that with a green list and you, you're actually learning two word lists together. And that gives you very high coverage within the specific genre that, that, that you, uh, you need to be uh, proficient at. 
And so we have four uh, special uh, uh, purpose word lists, uh, one for academic vocabulary, one for TOEIC, one for business English, and one for fitness. The fitness is one of the ones we're releasing this month. But also um, we have uh, subcomponents of the new general service list. Uh, one of them is the new general service list spoken, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. That's 700 words that occurs very, very frequently in spoken English. So if your focus is only spoken English, that's the word list you wanna be working with. But but if you're focusing on children's English and you're teaching young learners, um, there's a, a, a very, very old list known as the Dolce word list. It was made in 1936 and it wasn't corpus based and it wasn't made for second language learners. It was made for first language learners. And I really felt in the same way that the new general service list needed to update the 60 year old old general service list. I felt that the, the Dolce list needed to be updated as well. And that's what we're releasing this month. And the coverage figures are, are absolutely wonderful. So we'll, you know, I'll, I'll get to that. If we just go in order, I'll probably get to that in about 20 or 30 minutes. But if you have to go early, I can I can jump ahead to that. No worries. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Just continue at your own pace. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, what you can see is, you know, the way I've got this graphic is, is that, you know, after you learn the yellow words, you go on uh, to learn, uh, the, you know, some special purpose uh, vocabulary related to, to, to your, the area that you need to uh, achieve in. And for not all, but for many, many students in Japan, um, many of them have the goal of going on to study it, uh, going on to live in an English speaking country, to go to, to attend college, to in, attend graduate school, to do something academic in an English speaking country. And what uh, many studies have shown is that the vocabulary used in academic settings is very different from general vocabulary and in fact is is very difficult it's much more difficult uh, you're learning a lot of technical words if you think back to when you were a college student you probably don't have many pleasant memories of reading textbooks most of us don't and the reason those memories of reading textbooks are not pleasant is because um, you know when you go to like introduction to anthropology introduction to chemistry introduction to applied linguistics that first book that you're reading it's almost all words that you haven't met and and it's very very hard because you're now below the 95 percent threshold and until you master those technical words you, you you can't really go anywhere so even for native speakers it's very difficult so what we did is we uh we updated uh, avril coxhead created a, a academic word list in 2000 it was a very good list it still is a very good list but that list uh went together with the old general service list which was very outdated so we created a new academic word list uh, to go with our new general service list and we get a little bit higher coverage for a little bit fewer words. And that's, that's what you can see with this one. So um, here, um, if you see, we, we have a, we've created an academic corpus. I'll show you the makeup of it in a moment. Uh, 283 million word academic corpus. And what you can see, uh, the yellow uh, section, the new general service list normally offers 92% coverage, but in academic English, it drops dramatically. It drops to only offering 86% coverage because there's so many difficult words. Words. But if we learn the 960 academic words in the academic word list, we bring it up to 92% coverage again. Um, some of our other word lists offer much higher coverage than the NAWL. And the reason for that is that the, the academic English is very hard to pinpoint because if you go to a college, there's you know 50 or 70 different academic disciplines, and and so we're, we're you know we're combining all of those disciplines into one corpus, so the coverage figures are a bit lower than some of our other word lists, but it's still above the 90% threshold. So this is a very good uh, systematic way to get above 90% with less than 4,000 words. Charlie, um, yes, uh, one more from chat. Yes. Uh, from Glen Hill, uh, yes. 12, 22 p.m. When I taught high school in Sapporo, yes. the students had 40 new words given to them every week from a word navi book of random words. To learn the 2,800 core words and 960 academic words, what might you recommend as a weekly or monthly rate? Okay, well, and uh, some of the online tools that we've developed are, are actually uh, uh, developed around answering that question. I, I would say the 40 words a week is not is, is not too much. I mean, I wouldn't go much higher than that. But, um, you know, the, the number of words you teach is, is probably less important than how you teach them. Um, you need a good spaced repetition, uh, time interval learning system, so that the words are not just learned in short term 
uh, memory uh, where possible the learning needs to be contextualized um, so you know not just learn in isolation which is what flashcards tend to do um, you have to remember that um, most um, Japanese college students will already know about 2000 somewhere between 1600 and 2000 of the NGSL words. So you're not talking about learning 2800 words from scratch. You're talking about probably learning uh, 500 to 1000 more words than what they already know. And that's a reasonable goal for uh, an academic school year. And there are a number of schools in Japan now that are uh, using these word lists. I mean, the, the word lists are used all around the world, but there are a number of universities in Japan that are using the new general service list um, to sort of, um, you know, target vocabulary learning learning and, and, and 500 words, 560 words, I should say, I'll, I'll tell you about that later, uh, but 560 words for an academic year seems to be a very reasonable target that a lot of people have met. Um, and that probably, I'm guessing, you know, might come to about 40 words a week. So that's, that's not a bad goal. Good. Um, this is just a, a, a quick slide to show you the coverage, uh, I mean, not the coverage, the makeup of the NAWL. Uh, Cambridge English Corpus, 250, 248 million words of academic English from Cambridge. But we also felt that academic lectures are very difficult for students. Um, and so we, we put in a million words from, uh, Amer of American academic English from the My Case Corpus and a million words of British academic spoken English from the Base Corpus. We also created a, a subcorpus of 100 of the top selling academic textbooks. And that was the makeup of the uh, new academic word list. And, uh, you know, what you can see here is that the uh, original um, GSL um, offers 84% um, coverage for general English, whereas the new general service list is about 90. And if we combine the old GSL and old AWL, we're getting about 87% coverage, whereas the new ones combined give about 92% coverage. So they're, they work together pretty well, and they give a bit higher coverage than the old list that they replace. Um, We've also created a TOEIC word list, uh, not because I'm a fan of the TOEIC test, I'm actually not a fan of the TOEIC test, but it's a high stakes test that all of our students have to pass. And I, you know, I, I you know, felt like you know, vocabulary learning is one way that you can quickly improve your score. Um, TOEIC is supposed to be a test of business English. I would argue that it's not. That's why we also released it the same year. Uh, we also released the business English word list, um, that, uh, which we consider a more proper uh, business English list. But for the TOEIC service list, um, what you can see here, we have a 1.5 million word corpus. Um, this, is, this, is some, this is the makeup of the corpus. Um, uh, you can look at that slide later. But uh, for the 1.5 million word TOEIC corpus, uh, the new general service list actually offers very good coverage by itself, about 94% coverage. And if you add the 1,200 TOEIC words that we, we, we found uh, from this list, it brings it up to virtual 100% coverage, 99% coverage for 4,000 words, which is, which is actually astonishing. You never get 99% coverage. We shouldn't be able to get 99% coverage. But the reason that we can get 99% coverage is because this is test English, not real English. So the, the fact that we got such high coverage is another indictment. Uh, of the weakness of the TOEIC as a, as a real test of real English proficiency. But it's a very, this list is a very good list uh, if you need to prepare your students for, uh, for TOEIC. Uh, we also, the same year, uh, as I said, uh, we released a business service list. And the business service list um, is, offers about 97% coverage. Uh, we had to go up to about 4,500 words, but we get very high coverage for the business service list. And this is a, a corpus that's much more representative of general uh, business English. So we have you know, magazines, newspapers, uh, internet crawlers, the British National Corpus textbooks, and we got very high coverage uh, for that. And uh, this slide here is showing uh, the overlap between some of our uh, special purpose word lists. Uh, it's not a problem at all that there's overlap between the various SP, the green lists, because usually students would not uh, study two of the green lists at the same time. You would only have one special purpose. Uh, none of the lists, none of the green lists overlap at all with the uh, yellow uh, new general service list. So it's kind of a step one, step two uh, approach. Um, and so, so what you can, you can see here that, so you can see here the yellow, the, this slide kind of shows that there's no overlap whatsoever between the NGSL and any of the green lists. 
And, uh, you know, what we would do is step one would be learn the yellow list. Step two would be one of the green lists, not more than one. And that's how it works. Now, um, the fitness list, uh, this is uh, related to a project that I've been working on the past six months, which was uh, helping uh, a gym, it, you know, who was a, an American gym that was coming to Japan. They wanted to have an English medium uh, gym in Japan, and they wanted to uh, identify what were the most important English words for fitness English. And and so what we did is we created a corpus of about 10 million words of, of fitness English. And uh, what we, you know, and in many, many different categories, and, um, you, can, you can look at this later, I'll, I'll, I'll make the PowerPoint available. But uh, basically what we found was with only 600 words, we were able to get 98% coverage uh, of, you know, most fitness English. And that's, that's not maybe surprising if you've ever been to a gym or if you've ever been to a fitness class, it's often the same words over and over again, but they're fitness related ones. So a very small number of words is offering very high coverage. Um, we also have, uh, the spoken English word list, and this is the three subset, the three sub corpora inside of the new general service list, radio, spoken, and TV. Uh, we took those uh, uh, separately and reanalyzed them to see what kind of coverage we could get with just create, using those three as the corpus. And what you can see here is that to reach 90% coverage uh, with the new general service list at the bottom, you can see it takes more than 2,100 words to reach 90% coverage. But with the uh, spoken uh, NGSL, NGSLS is what we're calling it, you only need 718 words to reach 90% coverage. So there was a university in Kyushu that, that asked us to do this. They said, you know, we're, you know we're, we're focusing on developing students' spoken ability. Would you reanalyze the NGSL and give us the frequencies for the spoken subcorpus? And that's how this came about. And we found that the 718 words was enough to get them over 90%. Um, and the final one, um, there was a question earlier about um, the children's English, and this is our new Dolce list. And uh, the original Dolce list was published in 1936. Um, and uh, what it was absolutely in need of, of, of updates. Uh, it wasn't corpus based and it wasn't designed for non native speakers. It was designed for native speakers who already knew a lot of English and to build sight recognition of words they already knew. Um, but what I've seen in my 30 years here in Japan is that a lot of uh, publishers, a lot of EFL publishers, a lot of schools, a lot of textbooks are using the Dolce list uh, as the, you know, the word list for students. And I realized that that probably wasn't pedagogically the best solution. And so we decided to apply the same kind of corpus principles to creating a new children's word list as we did to all of the other lists I've, uh, I've introduced to you. So the purpose of our new Dolce list is more focused on the needs of non-native speakers. And we're focused not on build only sight recognition of words they already knew, but building basic understanding of, uh, of words that they don't know yet and are more, most likely to encounter in EFL uh, context. Texts. So the corpus is about two and a half million words. It, it, it has a, a huge chunk of it is children's graded readers, which is something that a lot of our students are exposed to. We have a corpus of the elementary textbooks that are being used by the Ministry of Education right now, as well as middle uh, junior high school textbooks as well. We've got a good number of, of picture books, uh, L1 picture books like Cat in the Hat kind of things, and a, a huge chunk of, of EFL textbooks, which is you know often something that, that our students are exposed to. We've also identified about a half a million words of, of, of English we, we, uh, from uh, top uh, YouTube videos, uh, YouTube channels for, for children. And we were able to identify those using uh, Statistica that, that helped us to find some of the most uh, popular uh, children's uh, YouTube channels. And uh, what you can see here is that just uh, the top 128 words of the new Dolce list uh, gives a 50% coverage of the corpus. So that's, that's huge. That's, that's a really high, high coverage for a very small number of words, uh, much more than the original Dolce list. Dolce, the old Dolce list, which doesn't really have any empirical uh, data supporting it, claimed that they were able to get 70% coverage. Um, um, and so we'll just accept that at face value. 
Uh, but if you compare the 315 word mark for our new Dolce list, we're getting about 8% more coverage than that. So 78% coverage. And we reach 90% coverage at 876 words. So that's, I, I think we're publishing it at 875 or 876 words. And that will be, you know, that will be out. Uh, you know, the list is already done. We just haven't put it up on the website. And this is the website. So, you know, basically the rest of the time, I, you know, what I wanted to do is uh, to, to, to take you through some of the tools that either we've developed or that we put our word lists up on. So all of the uh, word lists are downloadable uh, from this website. All of the tools are either downloadable or linkable uh, from this website. Um, there's also a good number of research articles uh, published on the word lists and, and, and we've got a, a running list of those uh, on, this, on this website as well. Um, Let's see. So what you'll see, you know, so that, that's, this is kind of a summary of what's on, what's on the list right now. I've also, also um, took the time to write definitions in simple English and, and Japanese for at least a couple of the word lists. Those are free and downloadable as well. Um, okay, so that's the, we've gone through the word lists. Um, now, uh, in order to use the word lists, you, you, you know, to make best use of them, you need good assessment tools. And, and actually one of the best uh, vocabulary tests that are, that, that's out there right now is known as the new general service list test and the new academic word list test. I didn't write down um, the, uh, the names of the, uh, the people who made this, but this is uh, Tim Stokel and Phil Bennett. And they've published, I, I would say, I wanna say dozens, but at least a dozen uh, articles on these tests. And they have some of the highest reliability and validity uh, uh, statistical data, uh, statistics supporting these tests of, of any vocabulary test out there. And what they do, what these tests do, is they, uh, it, it, they do a, ra a stratified random sampling of different frequency bands from the word lists and, and try to help you to identify uh, where your students are strong and where your students are weak. Uh, what you can see here is, uh, is output from the test for one of my students. Um, the, the, the test is broken down into 560 word bands, um, and that was done for a purpose as well, because Phil and Tim uh, use 560 words, uh, like about one fifth of the NGSL as, as a yearly goal. And so they wanted to find out which band the students were weakest at. And then, and then send students to study there. And, and so what you can see here for this particular student, um, you, you can see that they're pretty, um, they're pretty strong in level five actually, which is the lowest frequency band of the NGSL, but they're quite weak at level four and, and they still have some work to do in level one, two, and three. So uh, what, what they would do here, what, what the test does is identifies where they're weak and then it connects the students with uh, word lists, uh, with word stacks on Quizlet uh, for them to study and, and, and fill, in, fill in the gaps. Um, Charlie, also, yes, go ahead. Sorry, question in chat. Uh, 1237 p.m. from Brick in Hokkaido. Hey, Charlie, will you provide a link to the tool you use and say some words about breaking down lists of words to make a corpus? Oh, um, uh, okay, so for, for corpus development, that's a, that's a whole other session, and we can, we can certainly talk about that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll introduce one or two of the corpus uh, tools that we, we've, we've used in this session, but there are many, many other ones that, that we, we should probably, we, we could probably talk about. And, and some of them I use in teacher training sessions because I think some of these tools are, you have good um, pedagogic value for teachers in preparing their lessons. But um, yeah, let, let, remind me, you know, if we have time at the end of the Q&A and I, I can maybe throw up a couple of links for the ones that I don't mention, mention here. Um, we, uh, Rob Waring and I have put together uh, um, uh, an application called Word Learner App, and that has all of my word lists in it, as well as a bunch of other word lists as well. Um, so not only does it have uh, sort of spaced repetition, uh, time interval learning, but it also has um, uh, achievement tests and placement tests for the word lists. So, so this is another one of the uh, online tools that you can use for trying to figure out where your students are, 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 are you know, need more work. Um, now for the learning tools, and, and you know, we, we, what we've done is we, we've put up um, all of our word lists onto uh, Quizlet, Memorize, um, we, we've done some trials on Kahoot, and I've also made a number of word lists. Um, most, mostly everybody knows uh, Quizlet, right? 
Um, so I won't go into it in detail, um, except to say that um, the, the th one of the things I like about Quizlet is that it's more than just a simple flashcard. Usually flashcards are just word on one side, definition on the other. Quizlet, uh, for any word stack that you upload to the Quizlet program, uh, it offers uh, six different, six, maybe seven uh, different ways of interacting with a word. So when you asked, what does it mean to know a word? Uh, Quizlet does more than most in terms of developing uh, multiple aspects of word knowledge. It's one of the nice things about uh, Quizlet. And we've uploaded uh, onto Quizlet in in, um, 560 word blocks, which matches the new general service list test, but also in 100 word blocks and 50 word blocks in case that's better for your, uh, your students uh, learning goals. So we've got different levels of granularity and you, you, can, you can get to the links, on, you can go directly to Quizlet and search for NGSL, but people all around the world are using it and many of them have uploaded uh, NGSL in stacks in their own language and, and in their own intervals. Um, there are direct links of the ones that we've made from the NGSL word site, uh, and NGSL site that I mentioned at the beginning. So that might be the, the better starting point. Other questions? No? All right, yeah, we're good, we're good. Okay, so um, one of the other free programs that, that we've put it up on is uh, Memrise. Uh, and Memrise is, is like Quizlet, uh, it's a little bit different. And one of the things that I like about Memrise is different than Quizlet. It doesn't have as many different modalities, but one of the things that's nice is it allows students to modify their own flashcards. So for example, we take the new general service list word trail, uh, which is about the 2200 word level. If students click on that and Memrise, they uh, get a flashcard and there's a little box that says, help me remember this. And this is where they can create their own, what they call, I think, memes. And these are like sort of mnemonics, you know, you know thing, anything that, that the student thinks can help them to remember this word. So if you click on the add a meme, um, here what we see uh, for the word trail, we see something that looks a little bit like Google images. And you can, you know, students can add sound files, they can add text files, but they can also add pictures. And here, what I've done is I've clicked on an image that I think reminds me of a trail. I've added that to the, the, the flashcard for trail, and I added my own words at the bottom, a place to walk in the woods. And now I have a personalized uh, flashcard. And, and so we've uploaded all of our word lists to, to memorize as well. So if you, if you believe, and there is evidence that students making their own flashcards does have some, some, some pedagogic value. So if you, if you want to not use pre-existing flashcards, but have the students you know, require them to modify or make their own, then, then this, this is, might be you know, another good tool. Um, Kahoot is a, is a great software. If there was more time, I would probably demonstrate. I've, I've, I've made stacks on Kahoot. It's a great way to quiz uh, students' knowledge interactively of the uh, various word lists uh, that, that we've made. Uh, I think I've got a couple of screenshots for the TSL. Um, and uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll jump through. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump through. I see we only have 15 minutes left and I have a number of other tools. Um, the, the, next, the next few slides are basically uh, about why uh, spaced repetition is important. And, and uh, I'm just skipping through those slides, but jumping through to one of my free apps that has spaced repetition in it. Uh, basically, the theory of, of, of time interval learning and spaced repetition is that you're trying to change short-term memory to long-term memory. And if students just study 10 words for a quiz that you're gonna give them tomorrow, they usually just study the night before, they pass the quiz, and then a couple of days later, they've forgotten all the words. And spaced repetition um, gives students multiple exposures, and the computer kind of does that automatically uh, for you, uh, multiple expo exposures at increasing intervals to the point that it changes short-term memory to long-term memory. So I, I've created a number of software programs that utilizes spaced repetition to help students to better learn the words of, of the NGSL and other word lists. So these are some of these are some of the free programs. You can see that the intervals that I've chosen for this particular flashcard program uh, is study the word once, and then study it one day later, three days later, a week later, and a month later. And and and, and so there, there's various interval uh, algorithms, and many people argue about which algorithm is best. But I think the algorithm is is less important than than having the the spacing and the multiple repetitions. And uh, usually over four or five repetitions, you can, you can get students to remember the words for pretty long. And what you can see on the left-hand side is the NGSL broken up into 100 word bands 
bands. Uh, this is, it says, you see it's highlighted at band 12. That means if you scroll down, there's 100 words at the 1200 word level. Students can click on the words they want to study. They're automatically added to the flashcard and then they can study them. Um, I got about 16 of those, uh, but I was just, it was just too expensive to create multiple versions of every app for every word list. So uh, Rob Waring and I uh, worked together and we created something called Word Learner, which is like a, you know, one-stop shopping. It's one app, it's got a built-in dictionary, it's got multiple languages. And not only does it have flashcards, but um, it, whoops, it also has, uh, it's like Quizlet where uh, students can learn not only by flashcard, but they can also learn uh, using uh, various word games. So I think there's six games and flashcards in, in Word Learner. There's also a, a test function. Um, let me see where we are and see if I can skip ahead. I don't have time to talk about e uh, extensive reading. Um, there are a lot of uh, publishers are using the word lists now. Um, uh, the In Focus series with Cambridge, English Central, a video uh, teaching English through authentic video. Uh, uh, the core of that program is our word lists. And uh, for ABEX, um, uh, Brent and I and Joseph are working on some books that, that teach the NGSL called Fast Forward to Fluency. That one, one of those books just came out recently. Um, I also, I, I want to make sure that we at least cover, uh, you know, one or two of the analytical tools as well, because this is very important. This relates to, you know, I, at the beginning of the presentation, I talked not only about word lists uh, and the problem of, of not knowing enough words, but also the difficulty of reading materials. And so um, the NGSL and most of my word lists are up and running on a number of text analysis tools. Uh, Rob Waring and I created one called the OGTE, the Online Graded Text Editor, and all of my word lists, as well as a number of other ones, such as Oxford 3000 and Cepher, are, are up there as well. And what a tool like this does, it's a pretty powerful tool. There's a lot of things you can do with it actually. But what it does is it allows you to, to gauge the difficulty of a text that you want your students to read. And it actually can help you to simplify that text to your students level if you know what level they are. And uh, what you can see in the left hand screen, there's a, there's a pull down menu on the very far left where you select the word list that you want to use. And then there's another pull down menu right next to that where you choose how much of the uh, uh, word list that you want to analyze or how much you want to be in level and out of level. And for the purpose of this uh, demo, I just, I just put in, uh, I think, Harry Potter. Um, and so what you can see here is chapter one of Harry Potter book one. And I've chosen the entire NGSL, so 2,800 words. And what you can see is that just, if you know just the 2,800 words of the NGSL, you're getting about 94% coverage uh, for Harry Potter. And you can see the color coding helps you to see which words are in level and which words are out of level. The red words are out of level and potentially words that are difficult for your students. So what you can do is you can go back and look at the red words and decide whether or not you want to pre-teach those red words words, or if you want to actually simplify the text and, and edit out those red words and use simpler words that your students might know. So the tool is very uh, useful and, and, and powerful for, for in both of those ways. A lot of people who are writing graded readers are using this tool. Uh, people, teachers who are simplifying text for their students are using this tool. And if you're just trying to analyze, if you know what your student's level is and you wanna find out if the, if the text is above that important 90% threshold, you can also use this tool. Um, it's, you know, here you can see with our business service list, um, you know, if you just use a current events article, you're getting about 95% coverage with the business service list and NGSL. But if you go to actual business article from uh, Entrepreneur, I think, uh, is one website, we're actually getting up to about 97, 98% coverage. Um, okay. And uh, there are other, the, the OGTE is, is a, is an, kind of an update uh, of the original tool, which is called Vocab Profile. And that was, the, the Vocab Profile, it's a beautiful website called The Complete Lexical Tutor made by uh, Tom Cobb. And there's a whole array of corpus tools. And somebody had asked about corpus tools before. These, I often do seminars just on this website. There are so many great tools there. But some of the tools are, you know, the, the interface is a little bit old and, and it's not always uh, super intuitive for people who are not used to using these kind of tools. So the OGTE tool that we made is a little bit simpler interface. It does the same thing, but it's just a little bit easier to use. But we only have, we're a one trick pony. We only have one tool. Uh, the Complete Lexical Tutor has about 20. So it's a very, 
it's a very nice uh, website. And all of, our word, all, all of our word lists are up on this website as well. And you can see the way it does color coding. It's a little bit easier to read than OGTE, the actual output, but the uh, interface for, for doing things is a little bit more difficult. Um, and uh, that's, okay, so that's, you can see that this is a slide from Jiro call. But um, anyway, what you can, you know, this, this is a quick, the quick run through um, of, of our word lists and our tools. And there are, there are actually a lot more uh, tools that, we're, that are in development, a lot more word lists that are in development. Um, but this is about the maximum of what I can cover in, in less than an hour. So we're about six minutes ahead of the hour. Uh, I'm free to go beyond, but I, I did want to make sure that I finished before my allotted time so that I had time to uh, either take questions or uh, hear comments uh, about people who are already using our word lists um, or using some of these tools, or if you are using other word lists and, and just a general discussion of, of, of how to handle vocabulary. And maybe my closing uh, comment will be this. I, I, you know, it took about 10 years uh, to develop all of these word lists and all of these tools. And this is obviously pre-COVID. Um, you know, so we were, you know, we were doing this, uh, we were creating these, these, these lists and these online tools uh, with the assumption that, that vocabulary is one of those things that could be done, uh, taught systematically outside of class. Um, so that you would have more time in class to focus on other things and, and be able to add something that, that's very important, yet you don't often have enough class time for. So we're kind of designed for asynchronous learning, um, you know, outside of class. And, that, you know, I think that there a lot of the things that I've talked about today can very easily be used in this era of, uh, of emergency remote teaching. Um, so that's, and that, maybe that's where I'll, I'll stop and, and, and take questions and comments. Thank you. And I'll stop the share screen. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Charlie Brown. So uh, might I just uh, suggest that before we take questions that we unmute our microphones and uh, perhaps put on the cameras and give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much, Charlie Brown. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, first of all, uh, for the questions, I'd like to just invite you to use the raise hand function in the participants list if you would like to ask over uh, microphone. Otherwise, uh, I'll start by reading out the question in the chat. We do have one. Uh, Glenn Hill says, you can lead a, st a student to water, a word list, but you right. can. how do you make them drink that is practice that's, properly instead of just doing it for no, no absolutely that's a, that's a fantastic question one that i've struggled with for the you know especially the past 10 years um as i you know i when i you know, sort of identified um i think actually this thing is 1992 or 93 when i discovered this this approach to spaced repetition and nobody had done it digitally yet and so i was real excited and i started making all of these online tools and really convinced of the sound pedagogy and I'd get up and I'd give these uh, speeches to my students and, and they'd be amazed that, wow, you know, Charlie, you know so much about vocabulary. This is so important. I want to do this. And then it just wouldn't go anywhere. And, uh, you know, I would, okay, well, I got to make the interface better. I make the interface better. Uh, didn't really go anywhere. And I never really got the pickup that I wanted. And, and uh, a couple of things that I've thought of over the years is, um, you know, one, number one, and I think most important, is that um, it absolutely, if you want your students to do it, it absolutely has to be a part of their grade. And, and so and it doesn't have to be a huge part, but I think, you know, I found that even if I just make it 10 to 20% of their grade and you make it more along the lines of not how many words they learn, you can do that if you want, but I, you know, I just sort of make it more along the lines of whether they do it or not. If you, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you're, you know, in this app X amount of hours or, or, you know, X amount of time, um, I'm going to give you a hundred percent on that 20% of your grade. And if you don't, you get a zero on that 20% of the grade. And you know what? That motivates them a lot. And the funny thing is, the really funny thing is, is that, you know, like I, I introduced space repetition to English Central. I introduced space repetition to, to a lot of these other kinds of sites. And everybody is reluctant to begin. And they, they, they really don't want to begin. And you give these great spe speeches and they, they still don't begin. But once it's part of their grade and they actually begin, it's amazing how quickly they get into it. And once the students realize 
uh, how many words they're learning and how effective it is and, and how much more interesting it is compared to other ways of learning the, you know, the, it, you get like sort of positive momentum, you know, the, the hardest thing is to get the ball rolling initially. And so the, you know, you know, bring them to bring the horse to the water, but how do you get them to drink, make it part of their grade. But once you make it part of their grade, then, you know, you know, sort of, you know, you know, heap praise on the ones that are doing it and, and put them in small groups and talk about the experience of doing it and brainstorm how to make it, um, uh, make it better. I mean, we had a session on student voice and I, I, I think my whole approach to teaching is that way is I try to make, you know, I may give goals, but I make it as student centered uh, as possible about how to get there and getting students to talk about it. So Charlie, which one of these apps actually does record the amount of time that they spend on it? And how does the um, teacher get that? I, I would, I, in terms of actual minutes, I'm not sure about that, but I think the most amount of data recorded uh, would be in uh, among the free ones would be a uh, word learner and um, Quizlet also I think Quizlet has an LMS now so I, I'm not sure if that's free or paid but they do have a learner management system now and you can track via uh, Quizlet um, as well um, if you're you know if you I, I know many people are already using English Central if you if you've got your students you know paying for that and buying that that actually has a very uh, comprehensive uh, learner management system and a lot of data on on you know, how much work the students are doing, how much time they're spending, how much they accomplish, what words they're having difficulty with, and so on. So on. I, I actually like that about Quizlet. I think, you know, one of the things about Quizlet that's very cool, even the free version, um, is that um, they, they, they put in a very, very easy to understand sort of graphic presentation of what words that you get correctly a lot, what words you get incorrectly a lot, what words you haven't studied yet, what words, you know, you know. And so it, it, it's, a, it's very easy for students to see which words they need to spend more 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 time on so i I'm, I'm a big fan of quizlet actually okay thank you very much the next question i believe will be from cassie she has her hand up in the list so go Hi. ahead actually it's totally relevant to the topic that you're uh addressing now and kind of similar to what glenn asked i was going to ask you or i'll just type in the chat too um so one of my schools uh they are now deciding that uh, I have a required reading class and I've just been using like select readings, uh, A to A1 level for this particular class. And they just decided, okay, 10% will be dedicated to vocabulary, but you can decide how you want to do it. <laughs> so I was wondering, I was going to ask you which app would you recommend, but then if you do recommend Quizlet, um, how exactly would you determine how to grade and score <laughs> well i mean i think you know what you have to do i mean every teacher has a di their own way of doing this but you know i i would say you know number of words right you know number of words uh encountered not necessarily learned not necessarily gotten correct but you know if you know if, if you set for your students a goal you, you you gave the students for example the new general service list test and you found out that most of your students were weak in band number four that's about 560 words um that are very important for them to know and so what you could do is say okay here on quizlet we have those 560 words um you know and what I'd like you to do is by the end of the semester is I want you to um, study every one of those words and and it doesn't mean that they have to master them or get them right but you know like set, set a numerical goal and then you know find some way to figure out how many of those words they've encountered you can either you know the, the learner management system would be the easiest way um, but um, you know there are ways around it I mean even with my uh, other free apps like uh, NGSL um, builder NGSL builder in those days, I, I, you know, I, I couldn't afford to make a learner management system. And so I just created an emailing function so that, that whatever, you know, whatever words were in each box or stack uh, could be emailed to the teacher. So it's a lot more work for the teacher, but it was a, you know, sort of an easy workaround not having a learner management system. And there, there, there are, you know, and, and part of it is just thinking outside the box a little bit creatively. There are different ways for each of these programs to, you know, to, to, to gather data on, on what your students are doing. Hmm. Thank you very much. And thank you, Cassie, for a great question, because I think that one's really at the back of everyone's mind, isn't it? Okay, Colin is next, and he had a question in the chat. Would you like to just uh, do yeah. that? Go ahead. Thanks, Thanks Adam. Uh, hey, Charlie, good job. Um, Thanks, my friend. Yeah, a question for you. 
Um, are there any tutorials, for example, YouTube videos or anything else like that, that we could point our students to? I've, I've obviously, I mean, I've, I've showed them your website and I've showed them how to download lists and stuff like that. My students are very motivated. So this sort of thing um, geared towards the students, I think would have great effect. It's a, it's a great idea. And I'm, you know, I'm on sabbatical right now. I should be in Europe at the moment, but I'm sitting here in this four and a half mat room wondering what to do with my time. I think that's probably a very good use of my time. Uh, I haven't made, uh, I've made YouTube videos or we've made YouTube videos to, on, on how to use some of the tools like the OGTE tool, which requires uh, some, you know, you know, some, you know, some people do need that little bit of extra help, but I think we, you know, we could make uh, YouTube videos, uh, uh, you know, about other tools and about the word list. Um, also, I should mention on the, you know, um, you know, if you need to convince your colleagues uh, about the importance of, you know, if you think like, wow, these word lists would be great, but I need to convince my colleague that, that, that it's great. Um, I also did do a TED Talk uh, back in 2015, and there's a link. It's only, it's only 10 minutes. It's only 10 minutes, and it's, a, it's basically an introduction. This, this same talk that I, I, I gave here, um, at the time, only the new general services and new academic word list were out, but we did have the Quizlet stacks out as well. And um, it's just an easy 10 minute introduction to why vocabulary is so important, high frequency vocabulary is so important, and how these word lists help to fill that gap. And that, that 10 minute TED talk can be accessed uh, from the website. Let me, let me, let me, I think I have a link to it. I'll, I'll put it in chat. Um, let's see, copy. Uh, let's see, go to chat and here, here's the TED talk. Oh, so, did somebody already do it? Okay, here. Well, that, so I, just for me, that was, that was the, the direct link to the TED talk. And so I just got an email from somebody in China who said they just added a uh, separate site, but they added Chinese captioning. Um, there's no, right now there's no captioning in Japanese. That's something that needs to be done as well. And I think probably what I ought to do um, is to make a, a, a more simplified version of the TED Talk for non-native speakers. You know, so, so instead of 10 minutes uh, you know, geared at, at, at non-specialists, which is what TED is, um, you know, do maybe three minutes you know, focused at students. And I, that's definitely something I should do and I will do. That's a great, that's a great suggestion, Colin. I was going to also suggest, a, I also have some other ideas as to how that could be done. And I think you, it, it, recruiting, it involves recruiting students. But anyways, if you're interested, we can talk about that. Yeah, later. please, please. And, you know, I, I, I won't be able to recruit students this year because I'm on sabbatical and pretty much not allowed uh, to do anything <laughs> with my university, uh, which is really frustrating because I'm an online learning specialist. And so this, this era, you know, of... COVID not only smashed all of my plans to be overseas this year, but also I, I can't help my colleagues when at a time where I'm actually in a position I could be helping my colleagues. So I'm not going to have access to my uh, students or teachers uh, for another couple of months, but uh, I, I, I do have time and I do have energy. And, uh, you know, we just put out two new word lists and I want to get some more tools up and, and the YouTube idea videos is a great idea and I'm, I'm looking for other things that you know if, if anybody if you have, if you start using the website and you're like well gee I wish you had this up uh, now is the time you know I've got about another seven months where I can I can build more uh, support and more tools and I'm looking for those ideas so please do uh, feel free to add those Ooh, a very exciting opportunity okay uh, next question is from David Juto it's not a question it's a comment <clears throat> And I uh, just like to say, we're really glad that you chose OTJ to share uh, some of your time and expertise because it's very, very, very interesting and useful, I think. So thank you so much. Oh, no, much. I, I, I honestly, I'd do anything for you guys. I really, really believe in OTJ. I believe in what you're doing. I'm, I'm involved with a number of organizations, um, you know, for many, many years uh, related to computer assisted language learning. And, and, and you know, what I found is in this, this time of ERT, um, a lot of those organizations have not stepped up to the plate as much as I would have hoped. I mean, they've done what they could, but um, I'm always concerned about the needs of, of, of frontline teachers, of classroom teachers, and the needs of students. And everything that I do is, is sort of focused on pedagogy. And um, I, I can, you know, sense really kindred spirits in, in, in you and Jose and, and everything that you've done for us. And, and I love this organization and, and the energy. 
um, that everybody, um, you know, I, I shouldn't say just your two names, everybody is, is contributing. And uh, it's, 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 it's a kind of a movement. And I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be a small part of it. Well, we're, we're glad that you feel that way. That's for sure. Thank you. Hey. Well, um, I think we'd probably better wrap it up there. Uh, I do know that Jose is actually right now doing a separate session on uh, a, a trick he uses where he gets students to record selfies, uh, which is a cool way of stopping them from seeing scripts and things like that. So I also want to go and see that one. Uh, before we go, I'd just like to clean it, clear up one more thing. Uh, Gretchen, I think, posted a answer to Colin's question just before. So, Colin, uh, please make sure that you put your eyes over that chat uh, before we leave. And uh, one last uh, round of applause for Charlie Brown. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Hey, so uh, Jose is on now. He's already in the session. And also we have uh, uh, Quinn Bielke, uh, uh et al. from 2 p.m. So we've got a few more sessions coming up today. And uh, then also hope you can join us all for the social thereafter. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. And see I'll you all tonight. Now, so uh, see you. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh.